Welcome to the Knock on Archery podcast, where we bring all archers and bow hunters together from all walks of life with the goal to educate, empower, and inspire you to be better both in the field and on the range. And we're off. Off to the races. Off to the races. Nate, say your last name because this will tee off this awesome <laughs> podcast. You're such Heisinger. a cool... <laughs> or Heisinger. Or <laughs> The Netherlands. And uh, Nate is Korean, by the way. If you are not watching the video podcast on the YouTube channel, Nate is straight up Korean with a Dutch, Dutch last, last name. name. The Dutch Korean. <laughs> and so what's hilarious about this is um, I have a lot of friends that are Dutch and I've been in a lot of Dutch communities close to Pella and Dutch mm -hmm. typically are pretty known for being crafty with their money and their penny, their kind of penny pinchers, right? <laughs> uh, that's a fair assessment. And, um, I definitely have some Asian friends that are also very crafty. And so uh, we can combine the two. Tony, huh? that's all you buddy, the master of, uh, every single discount code on the internet <laughs> and, <laughs> He, it's like he has no reason to need a discount code or a deal, but he pursues the deal to the nth degree. It's a, it's a thrill of the chase. Yeah. When, when, I, when you and I started talking, I'm like, I go, do you pinch pennies? You're like, I have not paid for anything I'm wearing. You had like, <laughs> you had like a free t-shirt from like every event you've been to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't paid for that one. No, the this one's a work, one, that work one. Yeah. BRCC <laughs> so guys awesome. got that one. I gave you your drink. Yeah, I did. Living That's a, budget. you know, people, they, people talk about all the things you can do to like make it in, in this, uh, in inflation that we're in, you mm -hmm. know, I saw some, well, if you watch the news channels, they they come up with some pretty dumb. Top 10 ways to yeah, save money. And some of them are very dumb. I'll, a free tip, though. Yeah. Like, this is something I did in college. IHOP used to do, like, a birthday kind of um, free breakfast. Oh, I no. probably made about 25 <laughs> different emails okay. and got the code. Here we go. Printed them off. And I would walk into the IHOP, same IHOP, or uh, yeah, same IHOP, and same waitress sometimes. And I'm like, here you go. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, you're like the kid who thinks they're duping their parents. Yeah. You know, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, I totally got away with it. You know, your parents are in another room. Like, this kid thinks we're that dumb. Yeah. That lady's like, oh, here he comes. Ah, <laughs> uh, crap. He just wants a coffee, the free Wi Fi to do homework. And yeah. meanwhile, all the cool Korean Dutch Hotmail account names are gone. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Penny Pension. Penny, Penny Pension Korean. Clutch, it's a clutch Dutch. Clutch, clutch Dutch. Dutch it's a Korean Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> the clutch. Coming in clutch. <laughs> free pancakes. <laughs> At hotmail.com, gone. Yeah, gone. I own those. You can, I'll sell them to you. See, there you go. I'll sell that, that account to you if you need it. Dang. Actually, um, I think a Korean has the knock on uh, Instagram account, which is why I'm knock on TV or knock on archery. But yeah. Let me talk to him. And most of his posts are like a really good like Korean dish or it's at a baseball game. <laughs> I'm sure two national <laughs> hobbies. Uh, I'm not really definitive for, but uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So, give me your background. Like, when did you uh, when did you come over? Yeah, and I kind of want to tee into that because that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I was born in Korea. Um, I was adopted when I was six months and came over as a baby. Um, it was actually interesting. I came over with, with like a bunch of babies and. They all flew into Michigan. We like chaperones, so it's not like a bunch of babies in seats by themselves. There yeah. were chaperones. And uh yeah, came to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um West Michigan has a lot of Dutch Korean adoptees actually, just with the area. Um so the, a lot of us came over as babies and like how far how far west? In. Like did you fly into Detroit though when you came in? No, I think our, I'm assuming ours flew directly from you know, Korea to somewhere, maybe Chicago, and oh, then yeah. to Grand and Rapids. Then in. So did you go through customs in Chicago? Or you wouldn't remember, I Yeah, guess. I wouldn't remember. You'd it's like, no hello, idea. here's my passport. So. I didn't know if that was like a helpful thing for like the Detroit Motor City mm. thing. Because Dutch workers, nope. honestly, like Asians and Dutch are freaking awesome workers hard work right ethic. super yeah. hard work ethic like a lot of furniture my my experience with dutch is like from the from the furniture 
side that's of little things. Grand Rapids, west side of Michigan, kind of right. And side. obviously, Pella here in, mm-hmm. in Iowa is kind of you know a Dutch community, but northwest Iowa is pretty Dutch too. Um, I think they have a tulip festival in uh, Iowa, but uh, in Holland, Michigan, which I'm oh. from, we have the more renowned tulip festival. So, have you seen both? <laughs> like, uh, I have not seen the Iowa one, but the Holland, Michigan one. That's pretty. It's pretty lit. The tulip. Tulip festival. Yep. Tulip time. Tulip time. Yeah. All right. Get back to baby time. I'll, yeah. I'll swing back to tulip time <laughs> later because I like I want to go down that rat hole. <laughs> oh, it's a rat hole <laughs> indeed. Um. Yeah. You know, grew up in Holland, Michigan, pretty much my whole life. Um, grew up in actually a hunting family. Like yep. my dad took us out hunting. Me and my brother out. Um, since we were kids, you no, know, we fall asleep but he just brought snacks we just sit out there kind of thing and then start hunting when i was like uh probably 12 and 14 like whenever i was like legally able to go hunt yeah but then um probably high school and college like i didn't have friends that hunted like, yep. i didn't have that community besides my dad and when you're that age you want to hang out with your friends so it's like oh, that was cool i'm gonna hang out with my friends now and my dad's like all right cool well and then um Post college, you know, bounced around, moved to Colorado, came back to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Which part of Colorado? Uh, Fort Collins. Okay. Ohio. Yep. So lived there for a year and a half. What'd you do? Honestly, I just moved out there. Just like a buddy graduated. Uh, like we moved out there with no jobs. Like we were just like, hey, let's get out of Midwest Michigan. Because <laughs> we felt like people grew up here, they live here, they'll work here, they'll get married here, and they'll die here. And we're like, we got to get out. We got to escape before. That's every town where you yeah, go to high ex- school. Yep. Every person that goes to high school thinks that. So the cliche <laughs> of we're going to leave and we're going to the mountains. Yeah, oh, we nice. just going to strike gold in Colorado and see what happens. <laughs> and four months of an unemployment, and then you just try to find any job you can. Not pretty, but it was it was a good time. Yeah. It was a good time to learn now try to risk, try to maybe fail. Meanwhile, but, your mom's sweating bullets saying he's going to die out there. And your dad's like, <laughs> he'll be all right. Wait till he comes crying back. Wait till he comes back. <laughs> yeah. And I knew I wanted to come back home. I'd just be closer to my parents, actually. So after that year and a half, I was like, no, this is cool. I had a lot of friends, stuff like that. The mountains are awesome. But yeah. I want to be closer to home. And made the move back. Yeah. Um, Harry, Harry's in that phase right now. He, he actually talked about like Boulder, Boulder, Colorado mm. was on his radar. So it was like Oregon and Washington. Luckily, you know, he ended up getting this freaking unbelievable, yeah. you know, PhD deal at, at, you know, over in Iowa, Iowa city. So he's only two hours away, yeah. which is half That's of the equation. Sweet. The other half of the equation is I'm waiting for him to think it's cool to come hang out again. <laughs> it's I'm a cycle. trying to learn guitar. So he wants to jam with me, but he might like freaking hate that even more. <laughs> like leave me alone. Stay out of my space. There's a certain cycle of time of life here. You come back to us like, yeah, let's hang out. Let's hang I out. wonder if that's why he got so fast. He just wanted to run away from me. <laughs> <laughs> he knew my pace was only so good. And he's like, if I can get, if I can leave this like these long turf, legs, yeah, these legs I, can, long, I can just outrun him. Yeah. yeah. I just look like an old giraffe just freaking <laughs> running through town. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. But, um, yeah, just, like, moved back to Grand Rapids, worked a couple of jobs, uh, worked at a uh, startup, actually, when I first came back. What um, kind? Uh, we made a recognized coffee maker. So a coffee maker for construction sites. It was called Ox, O-X-X. Um, but it was, like, a super recognized Keurig. Yeah, and so we had some you no know, funding, kind of like how Dewalt and Milwaukee make those freaking boom boxes that have like yeah, the freaking exactly. You can ro- stand on them, you can drop cages them. around them. Yep, but exactly. A, so that was in- a coffee maker. Okay, cool. Um, so that's fun. Actually, <laughs> it was there for like three years. I did start off doing just like customer service, but then I got involved with like fixing the makers. Like I was like, I went to our founders, like Jim. I think I can fix these and you can save money. You did, dang. So, you, you know, the Dutch side came in and was like, like, I can fix this. Yep. God damn. And it came to where I started working on the product. I started working with our engineers in China. And Jim actually sent me to China at like 20, I think it was like 23 or 24 years old. And he wrote down instructions. This wasn't the word. Here, I'm going <laughs> to email your print. He like wrote down instructions. All right, you'll land in Hong Kong. You have to go to this hotel. You'll have to find the bus to bring you to the hotel. 
in the basement of the hotel. You get to wake up early because that's the ferry <laughs> to get to mainland China. When you get there, they should pick you up. The factory should pick you up. <laughs> I'm like, okay, it's like amazing race. <laughs> so, yeah, so I went to China twice to work. It was weird because, you know, they see me. I think, oh, yeah, he knows the language. I'm like, frick, I don't know any Chinese. <laughs> like, this is bad. <laughs> Where's the McDonald's? Little did you know your trip to Colorado and learning how to make it on your own meant nothing compared to going to China by yourself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're like, okay, this this had no purpose. Yeah, yeah. But it's like the second time, like they like, they recognized me. Oh, he's coming back. This is cool. So oh, that was that awesome. was cool. Like working with the people there. Did I mean what what was your experience like there? Do you feel like that kind of prepped you for anything current? Uh, maybe a little bit. Just like. It was interesting seeing how they think. Yeah. Just like, I don't know. And just from engineering side, like, okay, they get it. They try to work it out. But I think the you know, creativeness, like that had to come from, that had to come from here, the States. Yeah. So they're the, the doers, not the visionary. Yeah. I'd yeah. say that's a At pretty least in that situation, yeah. especially when you're going yeah. to a factory, yeah. they love to just have direction on this is what we mm-hmm. want. And then just it like seems like they're masters. A lot of engineers from any kind of stage just like let me yeah let's just let me do it kind of thing but um yeah so i started there and then one of the guys who actually hired me at ox um his name is spencer he actually probably about eight months nine months in like he started with this other company um he's actually started consulting for him just helping them grow um but that company's called hunt wise and so he was over there i stayed in contact with spencer Probably about like my third year in an ox, I was like getting a little restless. Just like, all right, I want to do something different. And I got lunch with Spencer and he's like, hey, we're doing some fun stuff. I think it'd be great for the team. What do you think about working with HuntWise? It's like, sure, cool. Let's do it. Like yeah. it's something hunting. No, I, it's something I wanted to get back into. I knew it was like an interesting opportunity. They were doing some cool stuff. I was like, sure, let's go for it. So when did you, because you're, super smart like when there doesn't you missed some type of a part where you became doogie hauser (laughs) (laughs) in electronics like when did that happen were you Um, taking like crash courses when you're in junior high or something uh, yeah (laughs) not quite i I still don't know i still don't know like hunting blind when people say like when like people ask me oh what do you do and i say i'm in technology it's like oh you're a developer you're just be a coder it's like yeah, nah, <laughs> not quite, not quite. It's like, um, I like people. So more of the relationship side when it comes to hunt wise. I think that's yeah. That's what Spencer saw in me. Just like how I treated from that from this time at Ox was like working with people, our customers and stuff like that, listening, trying to make our product better. He was like, We need that for hunt wise. Like we need someone to help us like grow our product and to listen to our users and figure out what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. And yeah, so that's where I started from hunt wise. It's a pretty cool, um, it's a pretty cool way to do it at times. Like at, there's been times where we've hired people that are very Mm. experienced in archery, but, um, I also remember when I got hired at my first archery job, which was at a manufacturer, it was at Matthew's archery. Mm. Um, part of the thing that was appealing to Matt when he hired me was that I was really, you know, I was only 18. Mm. So he saw a work ethic and he saw a passion for the product, but he also saw an opportunity to mold someone that's without, huge. yeah, because there's kind of this fine line of like, you want someone that's educated and experienced, but you also want someone, if you know what you're doing and if you know, if you have a clear vision of where you're going, you also want someone that, you have the ability to mold into like doing what you need to do and doing it right. Which I was, I feel super lucky that, you know, because I was, I, you know, when you're 18, you don't know anything. Right. I mean, I knew a few things, how to throw a football and, you know, how to like ditch school and, you know, (laughs) well, it's interesting. I think, you know, the fact that, you know, to play football, like there's, there's a trait that comes with that. Like there's, like three things we look at for at people it's like hungry humble and you no know, coachable yep. like are you able to learn something are you willing to learn so i think just like anytime like team sports like 
you're naturally integrated into learning. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting too, when you think about it, I've been really fortunate to, um, to have some people on the podcast that are super successful in the Mm -hmm. business world. Um, and there was, there was kind of a time where I did like an icon series where I, you know, I went to people, uh, you know, like Jeremy founder, you know, at Traeger, he's not founder, but CEO now. And then, you know, like having someone like Evan Hafer, you know, having people that are kind of icons or moguls within their field. But a lot of those people, at least at the current situation, there's so much good information like these, like those podcasts would be super helpful for someone like me that was starting a business. Because yeah. even when I was able to have a conversation that anybody could listen to anywhere in the world, when I was able to have this conversation that was, you know, Hey Evan, if you could do anything different, what would it be? And you can just listen to it and you can play it back and listen to it again. When you look back in time before all that stuff was available, you know, someone had to like read about it. And even if you took time to like read a whole book, they're not all great. You know, they're not, they're not all good. So, and then at least my experience with like Matt at the time was he had so many plates in the air, like, Mm. which is what made him think about things all the time because he just never stopped. Um, What was brilliant about that is, he, he, I don't think he ever slowed down enough to like, I don't think read things specific to like, you know, betterment and business and stuff. So when you look back at some of those, those people that had real success in the eighties, nineties, yeah. they were doing it off. Like, I think just really good discipline, work ethic and, probably a lot of luck to not just like nose dive right off the get go, but then maybe get lucky and find a mentor somewhere where you can communicate with. But in a lot of those situations, like even when I think of myself with like a Jocko, mm-hmm. right. A Jocko, a Leif Babin, or like last week I had Jason um, Gardner here. I mean, these guys are leaders, right? They're total leaders, but they're there. It's not like I talk to them about leadership every right. day. So it's pretty cool when you look at people that had success during a time where it was harder to get it, in my opinion. Whereas now, you know, someone like that can find someone like you. There's so many resources out there. Yeah, find the resource and then be able to, like, shape someone to really, you know, develop something that's coming out. And as consumers, we're just benefiting right now. We're especially, like, in archery. I I look at how many people are good fast and i'm like this is this is a hundred percent just credited to the fact that free information improves totally. a field whether it's you know for me it's archery field and there was certainly a time where i didn't make friends professionally for helping other people and and honestly korea was one where multiple high level archers came up to me very specifically and said if so help me if you freaking talk to the Korean coaches because Korea was almost unstoppable in the recurve realm. Mm -hmm. And when compound came into like the pan and games, well now everyone's like, crap, this has a shot at making an Olympics. And in that case, U S needs to just keep dominating. And so I actually, uh, um, I was actually a speaker at a Olympic coaching conference in oh. Rio where I met one of the founders to Korean archery. Oh, that's awesome. And, and he actually knocked on my door one night at like 11 o'clock and he said, can you show me something about compound archery? Cause I'd, I'd given a coaching thing and one of my breakouts was, you know, mechanically, which they knew how to work on recurves, but Mm -hmm. compound and, and in the back of my mind, I could think of people saying like, so help me Dudley, if you freaking put them on the path, but I'm like, you know what, this is going to, yeah, the Koreans, you know, Asia's getting ready to get really freaking good. And guess what? We have a bunch of studs over here. They're going to step it up. And that's why a teenager wins Vegas now, Yeah, you know, because that's the bar gets raised. And when the bar gets raised, everybody's got to jump at the bar. 
everybody's good. And then someone figures out how to get over it. And then everyone's like, oh man, okay, you can actually get over that bar. So then, you know, more and more people start asking. So I think it's like critical that we keep developing tools that as an industry lets us get better. Because in the end, to me, I started competitive archery to be a better bow hunter. That was my nucleus. I want, you know, I, I shoot target archery to be a better bow hunter. Mm -hmm. I'm a better bow hunter because I shoot target archery. So that was always my nucleus. So if I can figure out a way to make bow hunters better then bow hunting looks better to the, the overall picture of the world and ethically, if bow hunters are more ethical and they're able to make clean shots and they're educated on how to make, you know, clean kills, clean photos, yep. clean food, and show that whole approach, which was, you know, again, the core of who I am, then I'm succeeding at what my mission, my personal mission is. How do I find ways to make bow hunting and archery um, more accepted and more acceptable? Mm -hmm. And then to have people that have more fun doing it. And so like every direction knock on, I say knock on, I feel like I make a direction and knock on follows um, because what a lot of people don't know is there is a separation. I'm, I'm myself and I do things that I like to do and knock on is a brand that like follows that and yep. knock on is, you know, honestly knock on is led you know, it's, it's led by Sharon and, and, you know, Sharon has amazing support with the rest of our team and with, you know, with Looper there and, and they just like see where I'm going and then they figure out a way to where we can put that in front of people. And so like, that's my mission. You know, I think it's just super cool that we can keep finding those places. And to me, like for this podcast, some people might be like, wait, okay, at what point, you know, are we going to hear Nate talk about, you know, <laughs> some freaking Asian water buck he shot? Well, he didn't. He <laughs> didn't. Did not but, occur. But what's cool to me <clears throat> is that you're actually coming into a space and a lot of these, a lot of these things that are coming into archery now, especially app-based stuff, are, are these toolboxes, like, again, to me, this is a toolbox, just like when I talked about Evan Hafer or Matt McPherson. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the ability to freaking download a toolbox, right? As a bow hunter, I didn't have a freaking ability to download a toolbox. I The only toolbox I knew was, like, my dad's used archery stuff that he gave me, you know, which was, like, half broken arrows and his old bow he didn't want and and like that was my toolbox and I was horrible at it. Whereas if people have the ability to instantly get better and then, then it ties right into like what I say my vision is for mm -hmm. me personally, this is what I want to spend my time with. I want archery to be, you know, accepted. Um, I want it to be ac accessible and accepted by the masses. That's what I want. And so it's cool that, you know, through through your whole background now you've come to a place mm -hmm. where you're able one you're able to bring what you bring to the table but without like hearing the rest of your story it's cool that you are coming in here with a previous background in hunting that wasn't like wasn't a complete timeline like hey i've yeah i've hunted my whole life bro and now i'm working for you and here's exactly what you do you like understand the core basis, which for me started with a mentor taking me hunting, right? Not telling me to hunt, just bringing me along. And then I tried it myself. And guess what? There was, there was a window in my life where my focus was being a collegiate football player. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, sh you know, I took my bow in the back of my truck to parties to shoot eggs off two liter pop bottles for gas money. But other than that, I didn't have time to hunt. I had practice every yeah. day, and there was like a window of time where I really didn't hunt. But when that day came to where I was hurt for football, I couldn't practice, I went down that little road and saw that sign that said archery shoot. And I went there, and 
did a 3D tournament, which was the first time I'd ever seen one, had lost every one of my arrows halfway through the course, got super pissed off because I'd never sucked something so bad, drove to a Gander Mountain in Wilmot, Wisconsin, bought another dozen arrows on a credit card that like I had for college. I wasn't, you know, had a limitation, bought freaking arrows, <laughs> drove back and then finished the course and then just made it a mission like, I'm going to find out how to be freaking good at this. This, I sucked at this. So I just think it's so cool that that <laughs> there's a lot of good messages, but just someone taking you out into the wilderness, like planted a seed yep. to where after you, you know, be, being a teenager and going Bounced to, co- around, going, going to Colorado, around, totally, got lost. yeah, getting lost in Colorado, <laughs> not making it. Then, you know, finding an industrial coffee machine, (laughs) getting sent to China a few times, not knowing your way around to now you've come back. And for someone you've met there, now you've came back into the hunting Mm -hmm. industry with a planted seed of hunting. But now you also have this life experience that is now shaping you to be able to have vision to a tool that someone has access to. I mean, to me, that's like so freaking awesome it's intriguing yeah it's it's always interesting looking back in hindsight just all the different stepping stones that got to where you're at now um but yeah just like the little bits of knowledge that you learn along the way just like real impact of like your perspective of where you're at currently so like understand like <clears throat> knowing what it's like to be going out for your first time let's say of hunting and just like not knowing and then almost like re-experiencing that not knowing now just like mm-hmm. going back hunting for the first time like three years ago it's like i remember this feeling as a kid and now i'm feeling it again as an adult like just like the nervousness of even just like climbing up again because i when i was like well you were doing it without a safety belt back then probably yeah that's, shitty that's tree exactly steps, like my dad everybody made a was shit in their pants <laughs> my dad made a tree scene. all right you gotta go up there i'm like don't tell mom about the, you know, <laughs> the steps or anything. Just go up there. You'll be fine. Like, oh, okay. It's like two by fours. <laughs> yeah. And then like now. now and like, now the secret is if you see the remains of that tree stand in a tree, that's a good spot. Like that's, yeah. that's like the, the truth of bow hunting. I don't know how many times I've like been hunting, you know, somewhere and figuring, hunting for days, mm-hmm. trying to figure it out for my first time. And I finally like, man, all the deer are like coming up this one draw and I reposition, I'm there and I'm like sitting in that stand and like halfway through the day when I'm freezing, getting bored and really just like looking at every squirrel and you know, my <laughs> phone battery's dead. So now I'm just like looking at everything and all of a sudden I just find these old nails and a couple remains of the boards on a tree that's like 20 yards away and you're like son of a gun yep freaking old grandpa smith knew this was the spot and i should have just asked his ass you know what i mean (laughs) (laughs) exactly or just mark it now yeah yeah Yeah. but are there things um are there things about like bow hunting that were are or still are like intimidating to you because you're you know i and honestly like for those of you listening what's what's really what I think will make a good podcast about this is, is Nate had experience and I'm hoping there's people that listen to this that were there. Well, there's two things. I'm hoping there's people that had one time hunted and they got back into it. And now they're trying to like kind of get it all put back together. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping knock on as a segue for those people to, you know, one, give you some, um, you know, kind of give you a little bit of, um, inspiration of like, Hey, like Nate here is like that same person. Um, but also I feel like for the people listening that are veteran knock on nation people for you to like, listen to this and understand the impact you can have by taking someone hunting one time. Absolutely. Like one time, you you know, you, you, because if you love our field, then we have to we have to not just plant seeds, but we have to water seeds. And, you know, sometimes just being somewhere and talking to someone and then being like, hey, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm a hunter or I'm going hunting this weekend. And if they say something like, which is a big one for me is people, oh, I used to shoot archery in our gym class and I 
totally remember when I hit my arm and like welted it. Like I hear that all the time, <laughs> but there's definitely times where I'm like, I hear people and, and like women say, you know, my dad took me hunting a few times and it was really, really fun, but I've just like never done it again. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, we have to be mentors if we're veterans to the community. And if you're new back in, then you've come to the right place because we, I'm here to water. Yeah. You know, if you're a seed that like, you know, came back in, like that's what we're here for, which I think is super cool. But are there things that are, that were or were, are intimidating to you? Yeah. Coming totally. in that you feel like us as an industry could do a better job of like helping you with. I think it's just like, like, where do you start? You know what I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I have an old bow that I had, like that my dad bought me when I was like 14. So it's like, understand this is not fit. Like it doesn't yeah. fit your drawing. Like, it's like holding up to you, like your nose, like this isn't going to work. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like 35 pounds. And, but it's like, okay, I know where I'm not supposed to be, but how do I get to where I need to be? Yep. And having resources of just like content, like, no, like, no, when I started working punt wise and getting back into archery. When did you first see Knock On? I think it was like 2019, like later in 2019. I started my first day for Hunt Wise was work, was actually going down to ATA. Okay. Like 2019 is literally getting picked up, jumping in the car, and driving down to Indianapolis. And from there, like seeing, you no, know, ATA is purely archery based. And that was, was like, two years pre-COVID. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Two shows pre-COVID. Okay. And so seeing that and like, okay, this is. I'm about to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. Like this is a whole new kind of, this has changed since my rough introduction to hunting. So this is like, I started diving into research, just like looking at content, you know, reading articles, et cetera. I think I found knock on probably, I think, I think I started watching some of the school knock videos, probably June or July later that year. Okay. Just like just trying to find content. Like, no, the you know when you're you don't know what to search like you start looking youtube <laughs> how to xyz yeah. and then you know just seeing a couple of videos pop up yeah and you're like so that's the cool thing just like it's it's a little like full circle for me to be talking to you right now it's like where that started from just like getting back into the space getting a, a new understanding of archery and like just like learning and so that's pretty cool to be talking about this and just like the idea of like how do you help new people like get resources basically shorten that learning curve like yeah. through conversations or th through resources or whatever it is that will help them be more prepared to be in the woods faster and feel more confident so how much of that like outside perspective are you allowed to bring to the platform like when you go back are are there times in meetings where people are you know like if i was in here with some of my closest friends we'd you know just be jabbering off all kinds right. of archery stuff is, is there times where you're just like hey from a newbie's perspective like have we thought of this mm -hmm. i mean are you able to to do that creatively to like yeah, bring in I, that I outside perspective yeah so the interesting thing is like you no know, obviously we were founded like jeff who started hunt wise like he was a whitetail hunter like he loved whitetail like he happened to be working like he, uh, I think it was like a video uh, projects that he would do, but he was also like had a computer science background and he just started figuring out how to f find the best time to go hunting. So mm -hmm. he just created sort of basic algorithm, create an app. Um, and that's how Hunt Wise started as the hunting prediction. You crafty Michigan people. Yeah, you know, resourcefulness. And like, <laughs> know how to do it. <laughs> and he just sort of tossed it up there just for him and his buddies to use into the app store. Like, hey, I made this app. Go check it out. And this is back when the apps, you could in, you could just make whatever and just toss it up in the app store and <laughs> download it just for you and your buddies. And I think he had a lot of people start downloading it. And that's, he's like, oh, I think I have something here. Um, now I got to fill the gaps. Now I got to fill the gaps. Yeah. Like, you know, he did idea pitches, raised some capital, grew a team. But I think the unique thing that Jeff had when it came to like, even just like hiring people again was a hungry, humble and you no know, coachable aspect yeah. of things. And a lot of the people that started working didn't necessarily come from a hunting background. It came from more of a, like in some ways a tech background or just like a, a 
design data, background, data, data design. Yes, computer science. Like that's where it's almost like the tech side that we just happen to be in the hunting space in some yeah. ways. And that gave us an outside perspective of like understanding, like, hey, what does this mean? This like you know the hunting lingo, yeah, like the hunting language itself, and like how can we make sure that this is easy for everyone to understand exactly what we're trying to create, what we're trying to design. So like all of us, a lot of us have that sort of mentality when it comes to what we're doing, how we're designing. And it's actually like some of the hunting side, like, Hey, does this sound right to you? Like in our copy, whatever we're doing, like, does this sound right? It's like, yeah, that makes sense. So it's almost like both sides of having the new person kind yeah. of like experience, but also having some history with hunting and just making sure like what we're doing does match up to what people are asking for. It's cool because the reality is like myself or a lot of my bow hunting friends, we would never say, let's build an Excel spreadsheet about our hunts. There might be people that have journals, mm -hmm. have, you know, have journals or a diary. But for the most part, I'll be like, we can either do all this data or we can go kill something. <laughs> but the truth is people that are, that are data oriented start to say, yeah, but you know, scare it's scary, but, there's people like you that can, if they study someone that is, you know, that is effective in the field, mm -hmm. they study enough, it's scary, but then there becomes an algorithm of why is this person successful? It starts to build patterns to your movements. And honestly, I feel like, I certainly feel like if you studied everything I did, like once I found an animal, or found a location for the animal, well, then what I've done to be successful, like once I've found mm -hmm. that pattern to be successful, I just try to mirror it. It's no different than when I finally figured out how to make a good archery shop, shot. Now, all I want to do is repeat it. You know, I tell people, um, you know, well, I actually, I tell people this, but I'm not the one that said it first, but, I remember seeing a long time ago, someone said archery is simply a two-step process. Step one is learn to shoot a 10. Step two is repeat step one. <laughs> and so I used to actually take that quote and I would lead off my coaching summits with that because the reality is, you know, I would say, who here wants to be a world champion? Everybody would raise their hand. And I so... I would bring up slide one to be a world champion. It's two simple steps. Step one is learn to shoot a 10. Then everyone's like, all right, learn to shoot a 10. Got it. Freaking number two. <laughs> this is going to be a sweet two minute seminar. Uh, repeat step one. And then everyone's just like, oh shit. I <laughs> only make one out of a hundred good <laughs> shots. So I'm like, okay, what are we all thinking here? Hmm. I said, so the basis of my process is to give you the best ability to repeat step one. So my process has boiled down every ingredient I've ever found to shoot a 10, which I've shot 10s a million different ways. And a lot of them were luck. A lot of them were horrible. A lot of them, I had no idea what I was doing. A lot of them were frustrating, but I, I finally found one where it's like, you know what, if I just repeat these things and polish and polish and polish and hone this, these simple ingredients, well, now it's this, now I know what I'm going to get every time. And if I don't do it, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to like, it's kind of like if you made, <laughs> This, this might be horrible because it's an Asian, like, um, but like in Kung Fu Panda, <laughs> when he like asks his dad, why are the noodles so good? Yeah. The ingredients were simple, but they were made with love. The The ingredients were, were way less than he, he's like, that's it. Yeah, that's it. But you know what? People go there every day because they know what they're going to mm -hmm. have. You know, I don't like it when there's restaurants that have multiple head chefs to where sometimes I go in and get a Caprizi and 
this guy wants to like add balsamic in with the pesto and right. it's like no bro i want like <laughs> pesto and put some balsamic on the side like the other guy you know so i've like tried to just boil that boil all that down mm -hmm. to where you know i can know these are the ingredients but then you can repeat it so from a hunting point of view if there's people like yourself that are able to take data from people with success and then boil it down to a place where it's like, hey, here's a recipe book that is based off the things that all these people that are having success are doing right. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's interesting just like, you know, putting that kind of perspective of a recipe like, you no. Know, I think as Hunt Wise has grown and how we've developed, it's like, you no, know, we initially answered the two questions of the when and the where, like with our mapping and weather um, algorithm. And I think it's like, hey, if we can help people figure out the when and the where, those are some of the two biggest challenges it comes to like, like where do I go and when should I go? Because like, how do we help people optimize their time? Like, you no, know, you have work, kids, family, other responsibilities, like you don't maybe have enough time to go hunting all the time it's like you no know, used to look up or ask me hey when should i go hunting i'm sure you get that question a lot yeah. like I, I see those comments you know in on your social it's like when should i go hunting like <laughs> I know. the rut and then it's like hey <laughs> <laughs> it's uh i don't know exactly what <laughs> yeah. the factors you're dealing with are but yeah i think that's the one thing that's a yeah during october and november i get a lot of <laughs> i get a lot of dms or it's like a picture of like here's my spot here's my two stands where should i go it's like uh, stand a stand b yeah you can uh, just take a quarter out and flip it and, uh, yeah and i end up saying like what way is the wind blowing <laughs> like that's my first thing don't hunt with the wind at your back yeah that's, um yeah i think that's pretty cool how like how rapidly are you guys building your team to be able to you know dig deeper into that rabbit hole like how no we've had some quite a bit of growth i think you know the when the where that have always been our core and those are the things we're always focused on like whether it's find more mapping more satellite imagery working in the weather um but i think the one thing that we're working on that we've actually are focusing on is like the how mm -hmm. um from the educational side we start we have a partner in the hunting education space um and they have a lot of new hunter students who are getting their hunter certification classes and like yeah i'd love to dive into that yeah yeah and it's like it's pretty cool it's like no everyone has to pass a hunter ed class mm -hmm. um and you know we're partners with the platform that helps provide that information to the state on the state level and for us to like basically help these students who go from education class certification to actually in the woods there's a study that they look at their from their own data it's like if we can get someone to go from hunter ed into hunting like they, they can tell the buy a license year after year after year if we can get them beyond like the fourth or fifth year like they're gonna be hunting for life mm -hmm. but there's yeah. also this study of their data it's like after people take hunter ed they just drop off like they got their cert um their certificate and they're overwhelmed maybe. but they're overwhelmed it's yeah. like no they do a post um certification surveys mm -hmm. like hey what's your biggest challenges and it's like where do i go when do i go like where how like what's like that it's like that that knowledge level that might not be trans you know given down from like a parent figure like it might just be like they're they took a class because their parent hey we want you to take this class but they're maybe their parent actually doesn't go hunting yeah um but that knowledge basis of like how do i do this like that's something we're going to be really really focused on um moving forward of the when the where and the how yep um and building like tool sets and resources around that like you know again when i came you know back into the space of like the how like i saw some resources you know you with school knock for archery specific but there's right. so much more i guess lessons that need to be learned or like how do you shorten that um learning curve for people where they can learn faster, be more empowered, and go into the woods and actually enjoy their time. Versus like making the mistakes of no, let's say they're going hunting, like they don't know how do I look, how do I layer clothing? Yeah, and like they're out there, they're freezing. They're never want to go do that again. Like, yeah. like this isn't for me. I don't want to be cold. 
but they had resources that we're trying to that I think we're going to be building to the help more, them that. The more you talk about it, the more I want to commit time to it mm. because it's like I feel like your ethos parallels mine, mm -hmm. which is I want the best platforms for education. That's what I want. But the other thing that you said earlier was, you know, like the where and the when. When is a big one because, like, trust me, everybody watching the podcast or listening, I mean, I'm very fortunate right now to where I do long, long days. You know, I was up at three, you know, falling asleep at nine or whatever. But <laughs> for the most part, I'm I'm doing really long days and fully dedicated so that when hunting season comes around, I can actually disconnect and I can maximize my time hunting. And I'm, I'm fortunate to do to do that. But there was definitely a time where, you know, I punched a clock. Yeah. And so, you know, my first forget what the I forget what our like stuff was. I think like the first two years I got five days vacation and then maybe after three or after five, I got 10 days vacation. And then I had to be there 10 to get 15 days vacation. Mm -hmm. So I think it was five. So for like the first five years that I worked, so 18 to 23, I only had five days vacation and I loved hunting. So I had to find the time where ideally I could go on a hunt, have success fast, and get back so that I could save my vacation time to do another one. Yep. So, you know, for me, my only ability to do that at the time was uh, just luckily for me when I was at Matthews, I was doing cold calls to dealers all over the place. And so I was lucky to be able to be calling dealers mm -hmm. and them say, dude, it is on right now. And a lot of times I would talk to dealers like where I would draw a tag. For example, when I hunted Iowa, I didn't hunt um, that close to here. I was in a, I was in a totally different unit. So when I was in that unit, um, I would, I, I actually had uh, a director at a Christian, uh, Christian kids camp, mm -hmm. Christian's youth camp. And so um, Earl would call me and say, it, it's happening right now. Like right now it's happening. And I would try to tell my boss ahead of time, like I want to give you as much notification Heads up, know as this possible. I can. Yeah. And if I tag out, I'm not going to take the rest of my time. I'm going to come right back and I'll be back at work. But like when I tell you I need to go, this is going to be my window hmm. kind of right here. And so – as soon as I would get that call, like I would try to be in the stand the next day. I'd, you know, drive through the night, be in the stand that day. And guess what? Like if there's a hot dough in that area yeah. and you have success fast, I would get back. So um, there was one time where between Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin, I shot four bucks in five days. And, and when that happened, I actually shot a, shot a deer deer in the rut in Wisconsin, then got a call. And then I, and then for, at that point in time, I kind of knew, I actually knew where my window was. I always loved 10 to 10 to 16 was like my window of the Midwest. So then I, I ventured out and I killed a deer in Illinois that next day, actually. And like literally packed all my stuff in my truck and they're just like, Hey, are you going to hang out? I'm like, Nope, I'll take care of the deer, you know, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so loaded up the deer, went to my next spot, you know, hunted. I don't think I had success, you know, right away. Then took care of the deer, cut it all up, hunted again, got one. And granted I wasn't a trophy hunter. I wasn't, you know, I shot rack bucks. Yeah. Um, it's on a roll. Yeah. So for me, I was just like, this is free. I got five <laughs> days. Like I'm trying to, you know, optimize it, and maximize. It's like being able to eat pizza once a year. <laughs> like I'm going to freaking destroy <laughs> some pizza, which is kind of where I'm at with keto right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So it's impressive watching on that. Yeah. But, you know, so, so that is so important. Mm. And so not only is it time, but it's also money because 
the other part of that is there were years where I picked the wrong time and I used my five days and I came back to my boss at the time. It was Joel Maxfield. And I begged and pleaded for doc time, which doc uh, time means, you know, me living on my own. Now I'm, now I'm dipping into the, mm-hmm. the fishing funds <laughs> for the spring. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so now when you're talking like doc time, you realize, mm-hmm. wait a minute, if I pick one wrong day, you know, if I'm, if I'm working a normal job mm-hmm. back then, one, you know, hundred bucks a day, you know, working, I don't forget what I was making, you know, at the time, you know, 18, maybe I was making like 15, 16 bucks an hour. So, you know, you look at like after taxes, you drive somewhere, pay gas and don't, and dock a whole day at work. Well, now it's a hundred bucks. Yeah. So if you think about like tools for that kind of income that now eliminate, not just the one day, but I probably botched up another four or five at times, you know, and then I realized like, okay, I've used up all my <laughs> phone or friends. So now I just got to go back and freaking work. It's like, ah, oh, this is the worst. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's freaking, it's intriguing. And honestly, I hope that there's a place where I can devote some time. Cause like when people ask me, you know, why I pick and shoot, People assume I only build bows for, for like quote unquote famous people. That's not accurate. Mm-hmm. You know, I show you those ones because I personally feel like it's very cool. I mean, everyone keep in mind, you know, I am a guy that left a college future to work for an archery shop for $4 an hour. And remember watching monster bucks videos in the Mississippi Delta in a, in a old used up beat up trailer house that got literally drug in there on axles and set in there. And I would be in there with like mice and stuff. And we had, we would watch monster buck videos, like the first four or five monster buck videos. And you just watch these things and see these deer that you didn't even think really existed. And then I would go out into the Mississippi woods where there aren't deer like that for one for two if you see a deer they see you at 300 yards and they're like (laughs) boom got you so you have to like you know you you learn to to hunt these things that are just super elusive from every like you know redneck out there that's hunted these things day and night um so yeah for me to be able to build a bow for honestly, in my opinion, someone that's like a hero, you know, I look at Jason Gardner, you know, the guy freaking, mm-hmm. you know, is a hero, right? Mm-hmm. He's a hero. So yeah, I freaking love that. Someone like Chris Pratt, you know, build a bow for Chris Pratt for a Jack Carr book. Yeah, I'm. I love showing you. I love showing everybody that because to me, that's something. As a kid, if you told me that, I would have. I would have just been like, whatever. No way. No yeah. way. But the truth is, I just built a bow for a mechanic in town, you know, who literally twists wrenches every day, Mm. goes home with dirty hands, has a family on a budget, saves money in his toolbox to be able to buy some archery stuff for his first time and, you know, give him lessons, teach him to shoot, go by and see him, how's things going. Like, that's honestly me that's not like on social media because some people, you know, are not, some people just aren't like camera friendly, yeah. you know, and I don't want to make them feel, I don't want them to feel uncomfortable, but the truth is that is my ethos is mm-hmm. like, I want to grow archery and bow hunting. You know, that's what I'm here for. That's what I feel like I'm here for. That's what I want to do. So it's just amazing that there's tools now that are making that, possible so cool yeah i think that's like the fun thing to be talking to you about it's like <clears throat> how can we help be an earl someone else like let someone know like hey help you optimize your time this call is dudley when, yeah <laughs> call, call dudley <laughs> hey when should i come out and hunt? Yeah. it's like exactly but i think that's the interesting thing an exciting thing like to be talking like you having that passion to help Shout educate out to earl taylor and just like man 
like this is gonna be something fun i think moving forward just like helping the space grow we need to figure out a way to like somehow make that accessible or give like some type of a cool access or a discount code or something to the followers put yeah. it put it in the description of this yeah. and let people just kind of get there and navigate just and then see it let me it get deeper into the rabbit hole i mean i used it and honestly um crispy told me about it and i used it and i was for me, it was honestly I loved opening Huntcast versus Weather Channel app. Yep. Weather Channel app's like, no, don't want pro <laughs> don't want pro version. Like, what are you gonna <laughs> tell me? It's gonna rain harder. <laughs> like there's not enough here for me to justify this. You know, I wanna know like where's What's the, the wind, wind coming from? What's the pressure like? Yeah. And then I like close my eyes and I'm like, Okay, let's see. I got Arkansas corner stand. I can hunt it with this. Mm, I don't know what would that wind be doing, you know, kind of thinking like that. So it was, it was cool from that aspect, but obviously I could definitely dive deeper into that. But the more that I get to know you, like I'm, I'm invested in relationships for me. Absolutely. And I, I try to tell people that a lot of our partners, you know, you're wearing a black rifle hat right now. The black rifle people are doing a lot for archery. Mm-hmm. I mean, a hundred percent Evan Hafer, uh is doing a lot for archery black rifle is sponsoring the total archery challenge which to me is the lifeblood of archers that are going out there and having fun they're not you know they might be intimidated by competition they may not have the drive for competition they may not be good enough yeah but what they want to do is they want to get out and experience the mountains they want to experience the outdoors it's a blast yeah they honestly it's like a mini ata show yeah. Which most people can't get into, right? So, like, you went in there and you're like, holy crap, why didn't my dad put this lone wolf tree stand up, you know? Why didn't he have a muddy blind? <laughs> you know, <laughs> tell me not to tell mom I'm climbing on these <laughs> shitty two-by-fours <laughs> and, and two-inch penny nails. Uh, no, I think <clears throat> to be able to, like, go somewhere and see vendors and actually, like, talk to people or, you know, to go up to a booth and be able to ask Kafaru, Hey, what's the difference between this pack and that pack? Absolutely. You know, and and someone, you know, like Aaron Schneider might be there to like tell you, dude, that's freaking cool. That's cool. Yeah. You know, why would you why would you know why would you not want to be part of that? So I, I think it's freaking awesome. And I and I love the backstory. Like yeah, for, it's like cool for, just like yeah. learning about and just like seeing the growth that they've had over the years. And like you said, it's like oh, it's not, it's more than just a giant party, but it's like, it's a lot of people who are excited to actually be there. Like yeah. they're like, people are genuinely excited about it. like, I've seen so many countdowns and it's like tr- <laughs> a train for attack. And like, it's here. They all say that until their quiver's empty. <laughs> and it's like, it's about more arrows. <laughs> <laughs> then it's countdown to get back to your archery shop. <laughs> pull a Dudley and go up and to uh, gain Where's the closest <laughs> archery shop? I need to buy some arrows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, badass archery, they've got arrows on the ready. <laughs> they're the smartest ones at the tack. They, let's say they're probably making the most money oh, as dude. a vendor. Yeah. 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 They're for, they probably go through an arrow saw a year. <laughs> that thing is like, that thing's spinning like my electric meter when I'm in my hot tub. <laughs> or the water bill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or my water bill when I, uh, this is a funny story because uh, last night I cooked for you. Yep um how was that amazing you fantastic sure? dude that chicken <laughs> yeah that's lord's chicken right there it, it was yeah what did you say you do with chicken i was trying to think you were telling me uh you said you know wait <laughs> you told me kfc does not mean kentucky fried chicken <laughs> it's korean fried chicken yeah <laughs> chicken fiend chicken <laughs> Matt can so that i too. so i like i picked I actually just wanted something that took longer to cook so I could talk to you for a little bit, you mm-hmm. know. Um, but it's good that I cooked the chicken because I didn't know that freaking that KFC Spot on target. Right yeah, there you on, go. Exactly. Right Spot on. on. <laughs> but Sharon told you a story um, about, so I was filming at the house one time and um, the freaking water softener was on. So I'm like, what the freak's going on with this water softener? So I went in and just like, unplug this sucker in another room and 
Listen, for any of you who know me, you know that like my, the only thing my brain I think does right is archery. I think when it comes to like, where's my phone, where's my keys, like turning a bathtub on, turning a sink on, le- I've left my car running outside for an entire work day. <laughs> like, you know, like that's just stuff I do. So anyway, I unplugged this. This was last year pre-tack, right when the first tack took off and we were on the road for seven weeks in the trailer. So I think it was like, it might've been like part of like me telling people like tax this weekend, blah, blah, blah. I can't wait to see you there. So I unplugged this deal where what I didn't know was because that freaking unit was unplugged, which allowed the timer to cycle that thing. Mm -hmm. It just like when it kicked back on the next time, and I don't know what I did. I might have just played with the controls until it just shut up at that time. <laughs> Actually, and then what I might have done was plugged it back in, but yep. just like. Oh, it's good to go. Yeah. But what happened was that freaking soft water, uh, I think it was a soft water tank or something, that sucker cycled water for two months. <laughs> so when Sharon and I got back last August, we had. I forget what it was, but it was like, it was thousands and thousands of dollars, our water bill. And I'm like, what the hell? Sharon actually <laughs> thought there was a sinkhole somewhere in our yard that we didn't know about. And all it's the water like water's going down. Yeah, because we, we had the water company come out and they were like, you know, doing their like, I don't think it was a tuning fork, but they <laughs> ding, were ding, like, ding, ding. They, yeah, they were trying to see if like, if there was like a leak detected in the pipe anywhere. Cause I'm like, listen, there's nothing we're doing this. It's a hundred percent your pipe yep. from the house from there it's to like the what, house. Fifty thousand gallons. Of yeah, water. I thought it was ninety thousand a month oh, or something. Thanks. I mean, it was literally like <laughs> turning a hose on for sixty days is what it was. Uh, so my neighbor behind us had an awesome pond because I think it all just ran out or oh, overflowed. Good night. But uh, we had a huge water bill, so yeah. Sharon's like, don't, and, and I, a lot of times I'll turn the furnace off if I have to like, if I'm going to like film something in the kitchen talking, you know, if I can like hear the furnace through the wall, I'll turn that off. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I've kind of lessons I'm learned. I'm not allowed to do that <laughs> stuff anymore. So, well, Nate, dude, it was awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. You yeah. guys, um, best of luck too. Yeah. Like I'm best excited. of luck to you guys all. Hopefully one day I'd, Jeff sounds cool. Yep. I mean. You're gonna say it's cool. You're gonna say that no matter what, because yeah. you just in case he listens. <laughs> like, how dare listen, you? But he's a good guy. He's honestly is a great guy. Cares about everyone. Is growing a great team. I think we're gonna be doing some fun stuff this year. Like, I think that our focus. It'll be a fun year. It's gonna be a fun year. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Well, cool, dude. Thank you so much for coming by. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for getting back into archery and bow hunting. That's going to be cool. We're glad to have you. Yeah. Great to be here. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Knock on everybody. Be sure to check out knockonarchery.com for our full line of custom design products, as well as free in-depth education and bow hunting entertainment to help you shoot at your best.